Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. My name is Justin Young and I'm so excited to introduce my brand new show, Just In Time. This show is going to bring on the folks from the entertainment business and give us a blueprint into their success. So they're gonna talk about what they've been through and how they did it. Our first guest has not only been on America's Got Talent, but he's also been on The Bachelorette. He studied opera and he's looking to take opera into more commercial venues. This is Mr. Bradley Whisk. This week's we have a very, very special guest. This is Bradley Whisk. We went to high school together. <laughs> we did. We did. I can't believe it's been that long. I mean, University of Liggett and, and Gross Point, for anyone that doesn't know uh, the Detroit area, uh, is kind of where we, where we, uh, we met. And actually, before I really started my music endeavors, uh, I, I heard Justin perform, and, and it was, uh, was like, wait a minute, why is Kenny G famous? This should be Justin. <laughs> Uh, this kid was unbelievable. Uh, seriously, I, I'll never forget that. In, in our assembly, you performed, and it was like this virtuoso performance. It was unbelievable. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Bradley. Well, you have had an amazing talk about, I want to talk about all of it from the, the, the Bachelor appearance that you made on the show to uh, your tremendous uh, voice. You're, I just caught a clip of you singing um opera it's amazing bradley how did this all start for you you know it was it was nothing i really pursued i mean both my parents were definitely musically inclined i mean my dad played the violin um and my mom played the piano but you know it was there was always music in the background while growing up it was never forced upon us it was more of they had the mindset of do what you love. That's what they instilled upon us, which was beautiful. But yeah. we always had, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, Chicago, Boston, Moody Blues, to classical music, you know, so it was a very diverse, uh, you know, list set of you know, many different genres of music. And um, which I know you can appreciate with jazz and everything. But yeah. you know, it wasn't really until my senior year at University of Liggett in, in Gross Point that I, I need an extra credit really. And it was like, take chorus. And that's when it, the inspiration for music went to another level for me. I never really, you know, dove into singing, you know, and, and wow. more in an operatic style, which was kind of shocking as well, you know, cause you know, you and I played sports. We were on right. a basketball team together <laughs> and you know, ran track, played football and golf. And, and it was just, quite shocking that you know kind of went into opera yeah no doubt but it really fits your 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 voice i mean um the clip that i saw was actually on a news show um and it just blew me away um awesome talent so did you take lessons in in opera voicing before that well no i mean it was really with uh mr foster or i, I think he had his doctorate so dr yes. Yeah. Uh, at Liggett, amazing uh, inspiration for me. You know, his background was at U of M. He was an organist. I don't know if you knew that, but um, yeah. you know, that takes an enormous amount of dedication and, and training, and it's 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 incredible. But he said, Brad, you really have something unique here and special. I, you know, if this is something you love, if it, you might not know if you love opera 100, percent but you have the voice for it, and if it's something that feels right you should seriously consider it and so actually that's you know when i was starting my application process for different colleges and 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 undergraduate programs you know i just kept saying you know why not why not audition for the music schools you know yeah. so i did it in the university and oberlin and msu and michigan all you know there was a plethora of different schools i applied for and um Lo and behold, I got into any university and I was and I was told that with a scholarship and I was told that it was an amazing program for opera. It was one of the best in the world. Oh wow. It was kind of the Harvard Yale of music schools for what I wanted to do. And I didn't know and I trusted the person that gave me that advice. And I actually talked to Dr. Foster as well. And they said, Are you kidding me? Do it. Yeah. And so it was complete immersion from which I know probably made sense to you with you know, uh, I had friends that went to Interlochen, you know, sure. in, in Northern Michigan, and they had amazing music background from, 
you know, I didn't even know what the circle fists and you know, all that <laughs> stuff, and music theory, music history. I'm like, guys, you're killing me. You're like, where's middle C? Let's start there, right? <laughs> so I, I would say the first year and a half of undergrad was intense. It was, it was, I don't know how I got through it. I mean, because it was really, like I said, the Harvard or Yale music schools, and, and, and I'm competing with people that went to Interlocker or have been playing instruments since they were five years old, you know? Wow. So, but, but again, my love uh, was growing deeper and deeper as I got, I mean, we put on seven to eight operas a year, which, oh. you know, most programs do two or three for the entire year. So sure. um, not to go on and on, but that, that experience was, was life-changing, really. Amazing, Bradley. Wow. So, so uh, fast forward, you then went to uh, New York, correct? Correct. So I did a brief uh, young artist program for opera. And then I decided, you know, I wanted to get my master's degree. So again, I applied all over the world, UCLA, Yale. Um, but then I came across Manhattan School of Music. And for singing, especially opera or operatic classical style, it's imperative with who you study with. Uh, really for technique, and, and, and I also tell people, young singers, having a good rapport with them as well. This is your voice. You know, it might, you might be a tenor, you might be a soprano, or whatever the voice uh, category is, but it's important that you have a great rapport with that teacher because you have to, there's an enormous amount of trust because if you don't do it correctly, you could potentially screw up the voice for the rest of your life and it could be life changing. So I chose Manhattan School of Music to do my master's, also got a scholarship, so that, that was enticing. Um, but but I, I wanted to be in New York City. I mean, the Met is really, yeah. the Metropolitan Opera is the mecca of, of the operatic world. It really is. One of the best opera houses in the entire world. You know, And so wow. that was really the impetus of doing my master's there. That's so. amazing. So, so for those that are listening in that um, have a, a, a truly a passion for opera, you, th your journey has led you into so many different places. What would be some advice you would provide to them? I, I think really clear to define your path. You know, what, what is it uh, that is applicable to you? You know, is your journey, do you really want to be completely immersed in the operatic realm? Well, that is, uh, involves complete devotion uh, you have to be all in um, for me personally I love opera and I, I, I am going to continue for the rest of my life but I wanted to take more of a commercial approach and that was kind of the impetus behind me moving out to Los Angeles after I finished finished my master's degree in New York City because I, I loved opera but I wanted to find a way how can I bring the masses back to a dying art form. And I know the elitist uh, of that genre will, will uh, not admit that, but it, there's some credibility to that. And, and, and it, you know, how can I, again, how can I bring a younger generation and bring enthusiasm to an art form that is hundreds of years old, you know? And that was, again, the impetus for me moving out to Los Angeles, taking more of a commercial approach. So I, I love this uh, commercial approach that you've been discussing. How let's 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 talk expand that a little bit more for us uh so our our viewers kind of understand that more how were you able to do that in la because i've seen you on stage uh doing operatic duets with with a lot of different people so can you describe that commercial approach a little more sure sure so again that's <laughs> i'm taking an art form that is extremely difficult and now making it even more difficult so the commercial <laughs> route is is incredible but it's it's very very difficult to get into and i think again if you have an obsession and a true passion and tenacity and perseverance you have a shot are you guaranteed absolutely no and that was again what kind of led me to doing uh, america's got talent so at the end of my master's in new york city that's when i decided to switch to tenor <laughs> if you can believe that or not after all this training as a baritone, <laughs> I decided, and, and for people that don't understand that, because Justin's laughing because he understands how difficult that is, you literally have to take all your training and throw it in the garbage, and all your repertoire and throw it in the garbage and start over. So, so anyway, so I went out to LA with 
I'm, I'm a tenor. I really feel that. And I've had teachers say, Brad, you have the tessitura, the higher tessitura, even though you have a very dark, rich voice to sustain the tenor repertoire. And so, and I'm, I'm, uh, I am completely in love with the tenor repertoire. So that helps too <laughs> with that decision. Sure, sure. So again, for the commercial realm, there's more uh, interest in that. A tall tenor um, is more intriguing than a tall baritone. It's kind of, you know, not to diss baritones, but they're kind of a dime a dozen, right? Sure. Tenor voice is very rare. It's very, as some people say, unstable. You know, you're going from low to, it, you, you know, really stretching the voice in the yeah. upper testatura. And so I thought, listen, Bocelli already started in the late 90s with this kind of classical crossover, as we call it. Uh, in doing something like we've talked about the prayer or time to say goodbye and things like this. Right. I thought, how, how accessible can that, can that be for the mainstream audience? Very accessible. Right. Because you might be singing a different language, but then somehow you come back to English and it could be from Italian and Spanish. But, but there's this um, very accessible element to it. And maybe simply just the simplicity of the melody, you know, yeah. the prayer. You know, it's very catchy, very... Love that song. Emotional. Yeah, it's great. You and your wife did a great job, by the way. So, <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, that was really the reason I went out to L.A. to pursue commercial um, kind of career. Uh, but again, it's, it's, not as, it's not any easier. It's actually more difficult. Sure. <laughs> so. What an incredible journey, you know, as artists, being able to expand your platform and take, take an art form like opera and try to expand it commercially is, is amazing. So I'd love to talk ab about America's Got Talent with you sure. and talk about what you did what, and, and how that went. Yeah, so being in LA, I was doing gigs for, you know, uh, uh, for different hospital uh, systems that, that had big fundraiser events, you know, um, mm -hmm. that they were hosting at Universal Studios. So that these were very large events. And they needed an opera singer. And, and so I, I was the only opera singer. Um, and then they had other acts. So it was very, very cool. So I did a lot of different events like that. I almost actually got to do an event with um, uh, Michael Buble and, uh, oh my gosh, super famous actor. I can't, I, I can't believe I can't. Uh, yeah, she was one of the first actors that could COVID-19. Oh Tom my Hanks. goodness. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Yeah, it was going to be in Santa Monica. It was going to be this huge event. Oh, and wow. they, we did a tenor. And this was before really Buble was already, I mean, he was performing, but he wasn't the megastar that he had become at yeah. that point in time. So it would have been an amazing opportunity. As you know, you know, and, and for other musicians that are listening, thinking about going into this, a great thing to do is to come in and be an opening act for one of these major stars or even upcoming stars because the exposure you can get, you never know what that will turn into. So I highly recommend that. Um, and, and, and also follow their social media. If it seems like they're about to become a star, uh, say yes. But should, in a general rule too, and Justin will attest to this as well, <laughs> pretty much say yes to everything. <laughs> Almost everything. Uh, <laughs> That's a good caveat, Bradley. I yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that was kind of, how it all got started. So then some producers had reached out to me and said, Hey, Brad, it's interesting what you're doing with the art form. Have you thought about doing, you know, a reality show? And I said, absolutely. Cause I'm very open-minded and I think that's a great way. As long as you do it in a legitimate way, that's authentic to yourself. Now, again, mm -hmm. for people thinking about that, you don't have a lot of control. You sound very uh, <laughs> long legal agreements that basically says they can do anything to you, wear a clown hat or whatever. <laughs> you know? But um, I had another tenor friend of mine from New York City that had a, a very similar background. He was uh, played sports like I did. Um, didn't start till he was 17, 18 years old. Had a you know, very big Italian heritage. So very wow. similar to me. And so we had a very similar story. And I thought, hey, wouldn't that be a very cool, you know, if you storyboard it, that would make sense for something very intriguing, interesting. And also here's two tenors that have a similar timbre, which is rare, you know. Um, so we did what's called an EPK. I know you know this, but it stands yeah. for Electronic Press Kit for anyone that doesn't know what that stands for. And we shot in L.A. 
and we I storyboarded the whole thing and it was just the two of us and it was just I think spot on it really I mean I was obsessive with it and we finally got the right take and we went to a professional studio to record the prayer and some other cool songs as well um and uh and then I submitted it to those producers within five minutes they called me said this is it this is oh, the I end. love it yeah I love it yeah so long story short I, we're, we're basically one step away from the finals of winning America's Got Talent. So we had the, the, the condition was we had to sing in front of a large audience, a live audience being filmed with the judges, Howard Stern, uh, Howie Mandel, Sharon Osbourne. And, uh, and lo and behold, the night before he backs out. Oh, my, my singing partner. Oh uh -huh. no. Which I can't believe to this day. Um, Big mistake. But, you know, the thing is when you're dealing with, and again, this is for listeners or musicians that are maybe in the classical realm, sure. there, there are purists. And, and sometimes they feel that something like that could uh, affect the legitimacy of their personal career, which in my mind is a complete fallacy. Exposure is exposure, especially in the 21st century and especially in the music profession. If you're really good, but no one's watching you, no one's coming to any of your performances, un unfortunately, it means nothing, sadly. And, and, and again, that's no offense to anybody. It's just the reality of the business. Mm -hmm. um, so as Justin will agree to, and I, I can't wait to hear your thoughts as well, but you know, it's also about you know, luck and opportunities, being at the right place at the right time. Because yeah. working really hard, no one's going to see that. That's just a given. We all have to work hard and no one may ever see how hard you're working, but that's how you get to Carnegie Hall. As they say, practice, practice, practice. Uh, it's so true. But in the commercial realm, it's about being around the right people at the right time and being ready. If they say, we want you on the, on the stage in 15 minutes and you've got to sing these five songs, you have to say yes. And then you have to go nail it out of the park. No doubt. That's what it takes. Yeah. You know, and you don't have two months to practice for it. You have to no. be ready. You, you, exactly. A lot of times, as you know, Bradley, you don't have time to get ready. You just have to be ready. And yeah, exactly. uh, I, I absolutely love your story, Bradley, because you put yourself in classically training, uh, of course, classical training for operatic uh, voicings. And then you've also put yourself in those niches uh, and those places uh, like New York and LA that you've been able to have some amazing opportunities such as uh the bachelor that we're going to talk about later and america's got talent like you mentioned now and a plethora of others um i lived in la for about five years and i had a chance to meet Babyface, and he 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 is a just an amazing we all know that he's very talented but even he will tell you that having a great song is only 30 percent the other 70 percent is actually luck and he'll he'll sit he'll tell you that so um, this, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk with you, Bradley, because a lot of our, uh, a lot of the viewers and lis listeners, that not only are they interested in you, they kind of want to know about your background and what you had to do your put, to put yourself, uh, various things, you, you, ideas and opportunities you put yourself in. So kudos to you, my man, because that is, that is, as artists, that's what we should be doing. That is wonderful. Thank you, my friend. I, I, and I know you've done the same. That's why I'm kind of telling my story because I know... <laughs> You know, and they say, you know, in a great book, if anyone wants to read it, and I think this is good for young uh, performers, singers, whatever you do, um, it's called Outliers. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, they say 10,000 hours is what it takes to, to master something. Oh, yeah. I would say you never master anything. You're always learning. You're always perfecting. <laughs> Uh, that's just the nature of music, which is cool, especially for improv, which is what jazz music is as well. In opera, yeah. we have vocal scores and things we pre pretty much have to abide by. Um, sure. But but I think, you know, we'll never really become a master. Um, I mean, I think outsiders would think we are like, oh, my God. I mean, how does Justin play that song so seamlessly? And, and it seems like he never takes a breath you know, for 15 minutes, you know, like, you know, but it's just, it's just because of all the practice, all the hours we put in, but yeah, check out that book, everybody. If you, if you haven't read it, I think it's very inspirational and it really puts things into perspective because this isn't something you, if you're saying to yourself, I think I want to do this. 
it's not going to work out. And I'm not being pessimistic. I'm definitely a half full person. I really am. <laughs> Glass is always half full. <laughs> but I also have to be realistic. So, right. Yeah. Right. So, so after um, America's Got Talent, um, was that when things with The Bachelor started percolating? No, not really. Actually, then I had to, I had to have surgery. Uh, I, I was always fighting uh, my tonsils. We're always oh. getting inflamed. And, and so uh, with a very highly regarded uh, vocal teacher, Seth Riggs, who was uh, uh, a lot of, I mean, you know, boys to men, Whitney Houston, uh, Michael Jackson's primary teacher for 27 years with Seth Riggs and wow. uh, along with Josh Groban and, and many, many, the list goes on and on. A amazing person, amazing person. And he secret, he, so he was a pop sensation in terms of a teacher, but he loved opera. And he actually knew some very, he actually knew my first teacher, Giorgio Tozzi uh, from IU, who was a very, very famous he was very famous for Broadway, but then he became this very famous operatic bass. Um, but he was friends with Sondheim and I mean, all these. I mean, he was the first to perform South Pacific. And um, wow. but anyway, you know, we had a great rapport because we we had a love for opera, but also, you know, he knew um, the voice and on a, a very intimate level. So after all this training. It was like two people that could kind of go back and forth. Hey, try this, try this, try this, try this. That is cool. Because I think that is getting close to mastering technique. Mm -hmm. um, but he advised, he said, Brad, you know, it's, I think you're going to go to this level. You don't want to be fighting, getting uh, strep throat all the time and canceling gigs because you physically can't sing because you're the, what they call is kissing tonsils when the ah. tonsils actually touch each other. So he, he got me to a world famous um, ENT, uh, ear, nose, and throat, for anyone that doesn't know what that is, which if you are a singer, find an ENT. They're very important. You should get scoped. If you feel like something's not right, trust me, you will know your throat extremely well. It's important to get scoped and make sure everything looks good on those vocal folds because, again, this is getting a little technical, but there are no nerve endings on the vocal folds. And when you look at them the first time, they are so tiny and they look so delicate. Well, they are. And so you have to be very careful. Um, so again, having an ENT on staff is, is, is paramount in my opinion. So anyway, he concluded and I trusted he did his training in Harvard and then his residency at Mayo Clinic. So this guy was, you know, and of course he's had uh, incredible clients, you know, so anyway. So I did that, and that, that really took some time to recover. Um, it didn't change the voice, but it, it was just, the surgery was excellent, um, just, just complications afterwards, you know? Uh, and so that set me back. So that leads into your question about The Bachelorette. And, and so my mom and sister were like, how do you not have children? How are you not married? We love the show, we're submitting. <laughs> <laughs> that was really the story. No, not kidding. <laughs> so I get a call and it's like, hey, Bradley, uh, this is such and such from ABC. <laughs> uh, would you like to get married? <laughs> oh, my God. So I, me being open minded was like, hey, this is awesome. Why not? Let's let's do this. Yeah, I'd love to. So that's how it started the, the journey with The Bachelorette. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, it was an amazing, I, I love the film industry too. So seeing the behind the scenes of those amazing camera, you know, and like yeah. all the equipment, that was more intriguing almost. Like, and the, and the producers and the executive producers were all like really cool people and artists themselves. And so there was already this immediate connection. Um, and I'm still friends with them, but um, you know, I got to sing with Boyz II Men, I guess is the long story short. And that, I, I got to sing their most iconic song with some of the other guys, uh, I'll Make Love to You, as everyone I'm sure knows that. Um, wow. Yeah, so that was surreal. Singing their, one of their most iconic songs, <laughs> you know, in Santa Barbara of all places, which is also like U of M. It's a beautiful area. It's, it's, like, it's like Ann Arbor, but on an ocean. You know? Sure. Um, sure. And, and then like 5,000, 6,000, I don't know. There was a lot of people there singing, you know, 
I, I started this song because you know I kind of utilized some of the lower you know technique, uh, more the baritone days, and so you know it it was yeah it was pretty amazing. Pretty that amazing. is just incredible. So that was season ten of the Bachelorette that you were on, correct? You know, I actually am not 100% sure. Okay, <laughs> I, I am because I just looked it up. I was just wanting okay. to confirm, but that, yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is amazing. Yeah. Um, so so <laughs> what an incredible journey that you've had yeah. and, and you're still having. So uh, tell us what, what happened, what comes next? And what were you thinking after the, the, the Bachelorette? Uh -oh. Kind of put yeah. us in your shoes because for a lot of us, you know, we're, we're all trying to make our dreams happen. And sometimes a lot of us, we don't know what happens. And this isn't just for musicians. This is for actors and, and anyone else. Yeah. Um, tell us what was your mindset then when you were in The Bachelorette and what you wanted to do out of it? Because you definitely had a commercial sense of what you wanted to do with, sure. with opera. Yeah, no, I think, you know, once I was over and, and again, you know, uh, best of luck to to Andy Dorfman was the was the girl on that season and amazing amazing person and obviously I still wish her all the best um, but I think it was after that concluded uh, it was more of just I guess life events see that's the thing too is that we don't realize that certain things happen and that are out of our control you know um, and so you know, it was more life events like, you know, uh, for my grandparents, you know, passing away, things like that. And, you know, that, that I'm very family oriented. Um, I love my family. And I think that's a very crucial part of life. Uh, I think it should be, if you're lucky enough, I should say, be at the forefront of, of one's life. I think it, it also uh, induces a lot of um, real feelings and emotions that you can really utilize to the audience so that's the point i'm trying to make is at the end of the day no matter if you know what you do what instrument you play or if you sing it has to be a visceral experience for the audience members and i think that's what differentiates someone that's you know of high caliber talent to someone just trying to do the industry if you can really connect at a deep level and we all know artists that are are magicians at doing that but it, it's if you can get to that at the core of that and the authenticity of that you know I, I mean honestly there it's unlimited what you can do and so I think I'm very grateful that I am very family oriented and so I needed to because now we're into mid 2015 you know and and I just needed to to reconnect and I had to also think about okay so what is the direction now you know should I go move back to New York City and go, you know, all in with opera again, and then maybe branch out again? Or do I continue this journey of more of the commercial realm and see if I make it? Because, you know, some would say, oh, you have, you, you've sung all these, well, it's, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, you know, so it's all relative. But um, that's kind of, you know, what happened. And then since then, I, you know, as, as you young musicians will start hearing the word gig, you'll start doing gigs, uh, you know, hopefully all over the world. Um, but I think that's what I started doing. I did some in Mexico, which was, uh, one was in San Miguel de Allende, which if no one's ever been there, they should go. It's a gorgeous area, it's north of Mexico City. Unbelievable. And I played some golf and I beat oh. everyone. So that was also <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I had like some 365 yard drive and the, the caddy's like, I've never seen this ever. <laughs> so <laughs> do what you love, you know, do hobbies too, guys. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, that, that's kind of what I've been doing. You know, I've, I really, I mean, obviously I've gotten into other things is I'm not one person to just do one. I can't settle on one thing. I, of course, I'm obsessed with being a musician and an artist and creating music, but uh, I also picked up real estate as well. Um, oh, great. Just because I love people. I love architecture. I love, you know, the feeling of selling a home to somebody and, and seeing their, the authenticity of them being so elated with getting one of the biggest things that they'll ever do in their entire life for most people, for 99.9% .9 of the people, you know? So anyway, um, that's, that's kind of, I, I guess, all, all, you know, all in right there. <laughs> that's I everything. love that. That key word of authenticity is so important because that's, 
I think that's really what attracts people to various musicians and actors. And that ability that you mentioned, Bradley, to connect on that level is just paramount. I know a lot of artists, let's just take Jewel, the singer, for instance, you know, she came out at a period of the 90s, which was primarily grunge, but she was just so authentic and her voice and guitar playing was, even though that <laughs> may sound like a juxtaposition, the grunge area of the 90s and Jewel, but she's still selling so many records of today. And uh, now she's getting into writing books and uh, she's just an amazing person. Gosh. Um, Great artist. And she's been affected a lot by anxiety and has actually come up with a lot of scientific, um, uh, basically, exercises to help those that suffer from anxiety. So, um, Bradley, it's tremendous what you've been through and what you're doing. Um, that is, that it blows my mind, all the things that you've, <laughs> you've done, man. Incredible. So how, how can we stay connected with you? Because a lot of the times there, there's probably people listening in from Michigan right now that would love to buy a home from you. Um, so tell, <laughs> us, tell us, tell us how can we can stay con connected with you? Well, you know, one thing, as you know, too, Justin, by doing a lot of, you know, TV and stuff, uh, you, you literally just Google my name, Bradley Whisk, and, and you'll know how to get a hold of me. Um, but yeah, I have Bradley Whisk on Instagram. It's my main Instagram account. Uh, and, and, and Facebook account, the same thing, Bradley Whisk. Uh, and, and I do have my contact information there as well. So obviously feel free to DM me, ask me any questions you'd like. I'd be glad. I love helping out musicians. And I know you agree with that, Justin. Um, please don't hesitate. Uh, if it is a question about a home, I'd be glad to help you. It's, I love it. It's, it's easy. I love diving into the idiosyncrasies of a home and, and every home is different, just like the human voice. You might be a tenor, but every tenor is different. Every vocal fold is different. No one has an identical epiglottis. Uh, look up the word, guys, if you don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> do some homework. Uh, <laughs> we're in a pandemic, guys. We're at home. Come on. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, honestly, just guys, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, and also Justin and I have been talking about doing something together. We will absolutely yes. perform together. We've known each other since high school, guys. We're not going to tell you how long <laughs> it is. We never will. And even it's if we find out, we still won't <laughs> agree with you that that's our age. So true. <laughs> so true. Oh, my goodness. So we, we definitely have to uh, perform together and collaborate. Yes. Um, and I, I would absolutely love um to to do this soon bradley uh do you by chance have some recording gear at your at your home studio i do i have i mean i have some stuff i i don't have okay. any i don't have any professional recording gear like you do just because <laughs> as okay. you know i i just i i know some studios in new york city and i know some sure. studios in la that i mean they've got millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment that yeah you know we can do that i'd love i love flying i love traveling guys that's another thing if you don't like traveling, hang the towel as well. <laughs> you don't like sleeping on a couch, hang the towel. <laughs> yeah. So, so but no, I would love to travel. Yeah. I love that, Bradley. So tell us, um, where can we hear some of your music at? Because I know I found uh, several great uh, interviews with uh, various news stations across the country on YouTube. Sure. But is there another place that people can go and buy your music? The, the, well, not, not necessarily. I think for the opera world, again, it's a little bit different. You know, sure, it's more sure. of you're performing, you know, all over the world and at different opera houses and they record the live performance. Then that's something that they could buy with EMI or some other uh, okay. recording company. But uh, primarily, you guys, you can just go on YouTube, go on my website, right. which is, again, BradleyWist.com. Um, Facebook page, same thing. My production company is B-Rad Productions. So I have a B-Rad Productions uh, Facebook page as well. Uh, check me out there. And again, if you have any questions or questions about technique or teachers or schools or young artist programs, again, these are applicable to more of the classical um, genre guys. But again, it, I worked with Seth Riggs too. And he was a, one of the most famous pop teachers uh, ever. Uh, so if you do have want some techniques for that style as well, again, write me. I can give you some techniques that that Seth Riggs shared with me that would be very impactful for that type of singing as well. Incredible, Bradley. Thank you so much. A little bit about your shirt, man. What is that? It looks awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
you know, everybody <laughs> should know who this guy is. Arnold, Arnold, <laughs> get to the chopper. <laughs> so he's, he's actually, and I know we're laughing a lot, but he's, he's someone I respect a lot. I think it's, he's very, very inspirational. His story and growing up in Europe and having these dreams and literally putting posters on his wall uh, you know, of bodybuilders during that time before he made it super famous, but also movie stars and all this. And, and just having that self-belief. I think visualization is, is and, and visualizing your dreams and goals is so important, guys. So I, another recommendation I have for you guys, and Justin, I know he'll say yes to this, visualize what your dream is. I remember visualizing, I was running on the treadmill, uh, thinking about my performance for America's Got Talent. And I didn't even know what the stage looked like. And, but somehow when I was running, I saw the stage, I saw the audience members and, and feeling as if I was literally there. And so when I, when I walked out, uh, Nick Cannon said, good luck, man, you look great. I said, thanks, buddy. I walked <laughs> on stage and it was almost identical to what I visualized. So that's, that's why I'm wearing this shirt. I think he's, he's definitely one of my heroes. I love that, Bradley. If you can see it, you can do it. Amazing, amazing. Have you ever met Arnold? Oh, I was this close. <laughs> Where were I you will though. I will. <laughs> I know you will. Where were you when you almost saw, when you almost met him? Oh, it just was. It was in California. He, I mean, he's got the Gold's Gym, and he's always kind of in the Santa Monica area, riding on his bike. And he's he goes to the gym. He still goes to the gym there just to kind of support his brand and support sure. you know how he started where oh, yeah. no one knew him and he was there and and uh he's just an incredible person he really is he's he's, he's very funny very intelligent but yeah <laughs> I, was, I was very close i didn't physically get to meet him but uh, i know one day i will get to the chopper get to the chopper <laughs> no <laughs> bradley this has been so much fun we will part two of this because i know that there's so much more we can dive into and I'm really looking forward to our collaboration. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait, my friend. We're going to, we're going to kick it. Yeah. All right, you guys, that's Bradley Whisk. We're going to leave all his information in the description. Thank you again. All right, see you later. <laughs>